Hi, I'm Adam Natale, Director of SVA Theater at the School of Visual Arts. If you've never heard of SVA, we're a preeminent art and design college in New York City. Check the video description for more info. Since 2014, SVA Theater has hosted After School Special, the college's annual alumni film and animation festival. The festival is normally a series of free screenings followed by Q&As with alumni who are successfully working in the film industry. Even though we're unable to host in-person screenings this year, we're thrilled to be able to present interviews with over 25 alumni who've worked on a wide variety of feature films, television shows, documentaries, animated films, and more. All of our festival interviews will premiere here on YouTube during the week of September 21st. We're calling this our work from home edition of After School Special. And our guests are zooming in from all over the world, from Singapore and Germany to Canada and California. Tonight's Q&A is what we're calling a SBA premieres, where are they now? Allow me to briefly explain. Every year since 2016, the Friday night centerpiece of After School Special has been a best of collection of work of that year's graduates called SVA Premieres. It's a highly selective program with approximately 20 graduating students chosen each year. These students get to travel to Los Angeles to tour film and animation studios, meet with major players in the industry, and to screen their films at a stunning theater in the heart of Hollywood. Since we can't screen the SVA Premieres Best of program this year, we're instead checking in with graduates who participated in SVA premieres since its inception, all of whom are already experiencing major success in their field. They've worked on major films and series, and we'll provide info and links to their work in the description below. I hope you enjoyed tonight's Q&A. A full schedule of the After School Special 2020 interviews can be found at svatheater.com, but all videos will remain on YouTube following their premieres. And if you're interested in viewing past after school special interviews, you can visit the School of Visual Arts' YouTube channel. Thanks for tuning in and fingers crossed, we hope to see you in person at SVA Theater in the near future. Hi, I'd like to welcome Alejandra Alvarez, a 2017 graduate of SVA's BFA Computer Art, Computer Animation and Visual Effects program, whose film the novice uh, made with Courtney Scriven was shown in the second year of SVA premieres. It's a great film that's racked up over 2 million views on YouTube. So I'd encourage you to check it out. We'll make sure that there's a link in, uh, in on this YouTube video. Um, but since graduation, Alejandra has worked on several major films and television shows as a 3D animator and visual effects artist. Um, those films and shows include Avengers Infinity War, Godzilla, Godzilla King of the Monsters, Stranger Things, It Chapter Two, The Nutcracker in the Four Realms, Jumanji, Welcome to the Jungle, and Zombieland. Most recently, she worked on Disney's The Call of the Wild and Amazon Prime's Tales from the Loop, both of which premiered earlier this year. So she's worked on a whole lot since graduating just about three years ago. Um, so let's welcome Alejandra. Hey, Alejandra, how are you? Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, so can we start out by you telling us a little bit about your SBA experience and, uh, and, uh, and about your experience and showing your film in SBA premieres? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm probably going to repeat a lot of stuff that people already know about SBA, but I want to make sure that, that um, is, it, it's said because it's really important. I think one of the things that I liked the most about my experience at SBA was that the animators had real experience in the industry and they were current. So I, I could see their work, I could look up to their work. I think that's something that um, is really important and I really loved about it. Um, SVA also really made sure that I got a lot of exposure after I finished my film. Um, definitely the S SVA premieres um, program really helped me. Um, I uh, had a lot of fun, one, traveling with my friends and showing off my film in a theater. That was really amazing. Um, but I also um, started to reach out to people when I graduated to to work. And basically, it, the SVA premiere really put my name out there to be hired. And that's actually what ended up giving me my um, Avengers Endgame and uh, Infinity War gig. 
so that's cool. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's that definitely cool. I mean, it's <laughs> one of the biggest films in the past, you know, decade. Um, so so yeah. tell us about that. So you, you made a connection um, via SBA premieres. So tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so um, basically, um, after the thesis showings at school, when, you know, when we invite industry professionals to look at everybody's films and films are graded, um, MPC was there. MPC was my first um, ever, I guess, animation job. Um, they were there, they watched the film, they liked it, and they offered me a job out of school. So I took it. However, a couple months after that, I got a call saying that the, the movies were getting pushed. It was origi originally supposed to be for Nutcracker. Um, they went through a whole director change at the time and everything was being pushed. It was my first job, so I freaked out a little and I thought, you know, I should probably look for something else in the meantime while that, while that um, resolves. So I reached out this, and, and at this point I was at SVA Premiere. So I was showing off my film to people and, uh, and I heard about Third Floor and Previous was always an interest of mine. I love putting together the sequences. It's, it's kind of the heart of every film. And I reached out to the Third Floor. I had no idea that the Third Floor was, had already been to the SBA premieres, um, but that was the answer that I received. As soon as I sent over my reel, she was like, oh, I just, I, I just saw your movie at SBA premieres. That's awesome. And within a few days, I had the job. And, and what film was that working on? Was that Avengers or? That was for Avengers, yes. Okay. Avengers Endgame and Infinity War, yeah. That's incredible. And I mean, so you've worked at several major visual effects studios. And for those who might not be familiar with visual effects studios, and m many, many of us uh, non-visual effects people aren't, you know, Third Floor, MPC, and another one you've worked at, Frame Store, those are some of the top visual effects studios in the country. So you've, in three years, you've worked at, at these studios. It's been great. Um, can you give us a sense, you know, beyond those first few films and the, you know, I've named so many others in your bio. Can you talk about sort of how your career has progressed since those first few films? Yeah, sure. So, um, previous was a great experience, but I knew it was temporary to begin with because I already had my, my one contract with MPC. So, um, as soon as my MPC contract came through and they had a specific date for me to go, uh, I let my team at uh, Third Floor know, and I left to go to Montreal. Um, basically, I for the first year or so, I just worked on what I was told because I, I thought, of, you know, I'm entry level, and I just want to do, I just want to do a good job with whatever I'm told. Um, however, so so first, my first ever film that I don't talk about too much was Just This Week. <laughs> I don't talk about it too much because I really hated the outcome, but that was my very first ever thing I did was a face replacement of, um, you know, that famous face replacement they did for uh, Superman because they like reshot some scenes after the movie was already shot and, they, and he had a beard and they wanted people to take off his beard. So we just animated the second half of his face. That was my first, <laughs> that was my first gig ever. I don't talk about it. It's nowhere online. You won't find it, but, but it was kind of like, I, I just wanted them to really like what I do. And they started to give me better tasks as time went on. Um, but then I found myself in kind of a, in kind of a rut when I was working on Nutcracker because they were changing directors and they didn't have a lot of shots for us to actually do. So I had a lot of downtime. Um, I found, this is when, like one of the times when I, I really grew up a little bit as an animator because I decided to just go out and, because I was in this, in this office with whole, all these other films that were being done. At the time, Godzilla was getting done. Um, and I wasn't meant to go on Godzilla at first. Um, but that's when I started, like, you know, I, I messaged the, the director for Godzilla, the animation director, uh, Spencer. Um, and, and little did I know, he was an SVA alumni, too. <laughs> so we hit it off right away. And he told me he would put me on the film whenever there was an opening. Um, uh, sh sure enough, um, uh, eventually there was an opening. But uh, I also was proactive about it because a lot of people wanted to go in the movie. So I also went and talked to my lead, Randy Link, who, um, who basically was 
fully responsible for getting me on the film because he requested me through. Anyway, the whole, long story short, be proactive about what you want to work on and things will come your way. I think it's very important to show like your interest in your place of work and not just sit down and do what you're told. As long as you like, as long as you still get your stuff done, you can, you can be proactive about what you want to work on. Otherwise you can find yourself kind of lost in the, in the wheel of things. I think that's a great piece of advice. Um, you, so let's actually show you have a reel and I want you yeah. to talk through your reel, which shows some of the shots that you worked on in several of, of those, uh, the television shows and films that we named. Sure, this is, um, Zombieland was a funny thing. We were a really tiny project and we were only doing a tiny portion of the movie. Um, but this was my favorite shot from it. It's just a zombie that walks off of the side of a building and just falls off. It's really, really short, but it was really fun to do. You can go ahead and play. Yeah. <laughs> um, this was a series of shots I got with two monsters colliding on Godzilla. And it was amazing for me. Uh, this was my very first assignment, actually. I started with the smaller shots in the beginning because they were trying to, trying to test how, how I would do. And then little by little, they just started giving me the, 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 the whole sequence. And I ended up with the sequence of the two Ghidorah, King Ghidorah and um, Rodan just colliding. And for me, that was, I mean, that was one of my very first big assignments in animation. And I really enjoyed doing it. Um, and then, yeah, and then, then we follow up with Stranger Things, which was, I think to this day was my favorite show to do. Um, first of all, I'm a sucker for monsters. I love monsters. And Stranger Things was like, not like heavy on reference at all. So everything that we did was just coming out of our heads. And obviously we were referring certain things, um, but I really enjoyed the team I worked with. It was really strong. My, uh, my supervisor was Yvonne Jardel. He's a French guy. I'm pretty sure I, I mispronounced that, but he's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, this was one of the very first shots I received. Um, uh, they liked what I did on it and they started giving me new, new stuff. This was when I was actually new at the company. I had just moved from MPC and I had been at MPC for about two years and two years and a half. And then I moved to Rodeo and actually it was just two years, yeah. And then I moved over to, to Rodeo and uh, they, this was one of the first, so they were really in a pinch. They had a lot of shots to get done, but they didn't trust me yet. So they started, they started me off with smaller shots. Um, and, but it was, it was, they were pleased and they, they started giving me bigger ones, which I was really happy with. Oh, you can go ahead and play it. Yeah, this is also a really short, <laughs> the terrible thing about VFX is that your shots are originally longer than you, what you see in the movie, but they, they have like, which means that they have really long handles. So I really wish I had the, the shot itself. But NPC is terrible with sending you your actual, like, your full length shots. So <laughs> um, I haven't received that yet. So I just had to cut this off of the movie and it's just it so short. <laughs> this is one of my favorite ones that I did on Stranger Things, this roar. Um, it was really fun. All, all these tentacles are separate rigs that I had to parent through the mouth. And uh, yeah, all the collisions on the teeth were pretty, pretty fun. <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah. This was uh, Tales from the Loop. This was one of my uh, most recent TV shows that I worked on um, and it was really fun. This was, I think, the tiniest team I've ever worked with and it was really fun. It was really, um, like, it was really fast paced. They didn't have a lot of time to do, to do the shots, which I think, I guess it's kind of the difference between TV and, uh, and feature where like when you're doing movies, you have like, you can do tons of revisions and stuff, but when you are doing TV, you're just kind of on a go, 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 go. Like you, if they like an idea, they want you to finalize it in the next day or two. Um, so that's kind of where we were. This was a really fun, fun one because you're, the robot is supposed to mimic what the little girl is doing. And, and kids are kind of like a little, they have a little less balance than regular like adults. and. She, she was, it was a really fun clip. Yeah. This was the most challenging shot from Stranger Things that they gave me. Um, it's a lot longer, but I only put in the, the real, the, the length that I, that I liked the most. Um, 
this one was one of those shots i mean the monster has about eight legs i don't remember exactly because it's been about a year but eight or nine legs and it's it was really challenging i mean the the rig was beautifully done everything was amazing but this kind of shot is the one that really puts forth like where your workflow like you have to have a really picky workflow for this for this shot to go smoothly um so ever since i did this shot which was about a year ago yeah um i've been working on my workflow every time i open a scene every time i i i do a new animation i'm constantly thinking about like everything that i that i'm like all my rotation orders everything that you have to set up in order for everything to go smoothly. It's, it's, it depends on each shot. It's very different. So it's, it's kind of like you're always learning new things. Yeah, this was one of those like ones that kicked my butt. <laughs> this shot, I, I mean, I'm ending the reel with this shot basically. And, and I did it. I mean, this shot is, it's not very mechanic, mechanic heavy. It's not very, it's not a very difficult shot to animate. But I mean, it's, it was the last roar that Godzilla had in the whole movie after he's been like, you know, defeating all of these monsters. And it was a really cool moment for me. And I was really, really fortunate to be given the shot. And, and I think it would be a shame for me not to show it off. <laughs> it's, it was really fun. Um, my lead was Randy Link for it. And I think he was one of the, one of those people who like really, really advanced my career not not so much by advancing my career i mean like in the way that i see animation he showed me a lot of important lessons one of which is communication like he he was really good at communicating with the client and like reading sometimes when you're communicating with clients and they give you notes they only send you a little paragraph um and he really like he knew how to interpret it in a way that like he he knew how to interpret what the client was asking for in a way that no one else I knew knew how to do it. I would read the paragraph and I'd be like, okay, they mean that I should make the roar a little snappier. And then he reads the paragraph and he's like, no, no, that's not what that means. That means this, this, and this. And it was like, it's really great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Oh, this is actually um, my, my, this is, this is a fun one I did with one of my friends, Steven. Um, he did the body and I did the face. And this was actually while I was at SVA still studying. I hadn't done my thesis yet. This was my frame store internship. And it was really fun. I, I was lucky to have worked on the Geico. You, you don't normally get to when you're in, in the internship, but it was, it was a special occasion because it was Warren Buffett's birthday. <laughs> so yeah, it was, it was really fun. That's great. Thanks for, thanks for showing that. And so one of the more recent things you worked on, uh, I mentioned earlier, was Disney's Call of the Wild, the uh, Harrison Ford movie, which uh, is on demand, um, but uh, I think it'll eventually be on Disney Plus at some point. But uh, it's, a great, it's a great film. It's based on the, the novel of the same name. And what's interesting about that, um, you actually got to go on set for that, which is really cool. And I don't think, uh, I don't know if a lot of people realize that some visual effects artists will go on set at some point. It, it, it can be pretty rare, but you got to go and we have some photos from that that we'd like to show. And if you want to talk about your experience a little bit with that. I never, I never realized the importance of going on set. Um, but after doing this, I noticed like how, how much of an eye opener it is, like how much it bridges the gap between like the team that's working on set and the team that's working on post production. Because as per post production artists, all you receive is a video with a plate that some people shot and you have to do your work over it. And we like, we like to complain a lot about like, oh, you know, what if they just move that thing that way? We wouldn't have to edit all of this stuff out. Like, we like to complain a lot about how much is wrong with the plates that we receive but man oh man a lot of work goes into putting this th these films together and a lot of work once you see once you are there physically and you see it with your own eyes you realize you start to appreciate that team a lot more than you did before so yeah this is um this is an L la center studios um basically the director of call of the wild um chris sanders invited uh, a couple of animators it's me and another guy called Amer, 
Amr Sharaki, very nice guy. Um, he invited us over to the um, on set because he wanted to basically work closer with the animators that were gonna animate the, the movie eventually in post-production. He wanted to, um, for us to be there. And he also wanted to reshoot some of the stuff that he had gotten from the previous team because he wasn't happy with it. So he had us animate, um, he had us animate some sequences and uh, he, they were using, sorry, I'm stumbling a little bit, but they were using this program called Simulcam. Um, I don't know if anyone has heard of it. For those of you who are not familiar with VFX, you definitely haven't. <laughs> but um, it's basically a, a virtual camera, but it projects your animation onto the set. So you can see the dog's animation on set through the camera. So if you're doing moves, like if you're doing camera moves that have to follow a, not, like a person or a dog or something, and they're not real, they're actual CGI, then you have like you animate them ahead of time and you project them with your camera in space and then you can react to their movements and you have like real life basically real life camera um on following cgi characters which is what we did so we animated the dogs um we used some of the mocap actually for quadrupeds which i was very impressed by because i definitely thought that it wasn't possible to do quadruped mocap but they did it and it was nice. Um, and yeah, this, this experience was amazing. I mean, having, I mean, not to mention that I met Harrison Ford. <laughs> he was sitting behind my desk watching me animate for like 10 minutes, which is definitely a check in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so having notes from Chris was amazing. I love the way he, he digests your animation, he looks at your stuff, and he, and he doesn't say anything for long, and he, then he just grabs his sketchbook and shows you what he means, but it, he was just someone so inspiring to work with, and someone, I mean, whose work I look up to. I look up to all of the stuff, all of the stuff he did on Lilo and Stitch, and on um, How to Train Your Dragon. It's all amazing. So this was a one-in-a-lifetime experience, and uh, yeah, NPC was great. They flew us over. They um, they gave us room and board. They uh, and so we were we were living really close to to the studio, and we were just driving back and forth all the time. So this is what the photo shows you what the stage looks like when they're first setting it up. So they set up like th they're setting up all the fake snow ground, um, and then in the next picture you can see um, they start bringing in all these trees. These are real life trees. They they're not fake. I mean, maybe one or two of them might be fake to fill in some stuff, but they want to be real precise about the stuff they put in here. So, yeah. And then on the next picture, you can see I got one with some lighting. So you can. So basically, the the sky and the background of all of these plates are, is going to be CGI. So they don't actually need to do lighting for the sky. They do it so that there's bounce lights on the, like there's accurate bounce lights on the characters when they're filming them. So. So Harrison Ford's face will show off the bounce light from all of these lights um, and that are later added on in CGI. So that was pretty, pretty cool. Yeah. All that snow is fake. <laughs> uh, yeah, so um, this was also fun. Uh, fun fact, the main character of the movie is called Buck. And this is what he looked like before he had a bunch of redesigns. <laughs> uh he was really cute he still is um and then they brought in a couple of dogs for us to play with uh, on set which is not something that happens in the actual studio this is remar remarkable for me because um vfx studios uh usually like for example the NBC studio in montreal doesn't actually allow dogs uh in the studio so we weren't or or any other animal really so we weren't really um we didn't have this type of experience before, and it was really neat. That's awesome. That's really cool that you got to be on set for this. So, you know, that was that was all pre-pandemic. <laughs> let's, let's talk about, I know you've been working, which is, which is great. Um, hopefully one day we'll get to go back to sets, all, all of us. Um, that, would, that would be oh awesome. Gosh. 
<laughs> but yeah. you know, we've all we've all been home through this, and very fortunately, I know that you've been working on a few things. I don't know if you could talk uh, about what they are specifically because they're probably confidential projects. But if you can talk a little bit about um, the types of projects you're working on right now and how you're staying motivated during the pandemic, I'm sure people would love to hear that. Yeah, sure. So um, the pandemic has definitely taken <laughs> taken its toll um, for everybody, uh, myself included. So basically, um, during Christmas time, uh, it was the first time that I was going to take some time off. So I took a month and a half off uh to vacation uh because i hadn't since i graduated and work-life balance is very important um so after i came back the pandemic started so uh i basically switched to freelance because out of necessity also out of curiosity because i've been wanting to actually try freelance for a while um but all of these cool like feature projects were coming in and i just never made the move the pandemic kind of pushed me to that that way and so I, I i embraced it uh ever since i've been working on a couple of different things not too much i've had a lot of downtime too um i worked on a music video uh for this really famous uh uh latino singer which is you guys probably will not know who he is but it's jay baldwin uh it already got millions of views so it's pretty cool um but i was only on it for a little bit so freelance is a lot different from what i'm used to because i'm used to being like spending months on a project uh and you you know familiar familiarize yourself with the teams and everything for freelance especially re working remotely you barely get to see anyone um i mean sometimes people have their cameras on on zoom but not always uh and uh and it's a lot shorter so you get to familiarize yourself with the characters a lot less. Um, however, there's a lot of perks. I mean, working from home is kind of cool. I mean, okay, there's a lot of cons to it, but if you're working from home and you, you're you able to like set, set a routine for yourself, you're able to do so many things that you wouldn't otherwise. Like energy level wise, whenever I would get home from work, when I wasn't working from home, I would be dead. Like I barely had time to take my my dog for a walk and I would just plop on the bed or watch something but now like I get to do a lot of different things I mean my, my one of the biggest pros I think from working from home is just that you can set your own schedule so if you want to start in the afternoon as long as you get your stuff done and you're there for the meetings that's really all you need to do it's really 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 nice um, I do look forward to eventually working in the studios again but working from home for now works um, but yeah, I worked on things since that I never imagined, like the music video, I never imagined that I was never looking for a music video before, but it was really, really rewarding and it was not really nice. It was a, a short turnaround. You didn't have to wait months to be able to show off your work. <laughs> um, same thing for, uh, I also got to work recently for a company called Eidos uh, in Montreal. They do AAA games. And I never imagined myself working for games before, but I did, and it was quite cool. Um, really, really nice work, really, really nice team. Uh, the pace is also a lot different in games than it is in, in everything else. So basically, I feel like so far, I've had a little taste of quite a few things that I, that I wasn't expecting to. So it's really nice. And you're, you know, you're working uh, from Texas right now, even though you're yeah. working with studios and projects that are coming from all over the, yeah. the, the world, actually. Um, do you have, do you want to show your work set up, even if it's not too pretty? And I think, I think <laughs> unlike uh, MPC, you can take uh, animals to the office, correct? So That's true. If you want to show, is... show us quickly. Um, we'd <laughs> that love is to a number a one perk. Okay. Yeah. I think she's laying down somewhere. So. One of the ways I deal with my work stress is my dog. <laughs> okay, anyway, my, my home setup looks like this. I think one of the most important for me, most important things for me is natural light. If you don't have natural light in your work setup, your eyes are gonna hurt a lot at the end of the day. And then Kida is somewhere. Let me just get her real quick. Kida, give me a pop. Thank you. <laughs> oh, very cute. <laughs> that's that's your, your 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 work mate right now. Your, yeah. 
she's my best mate and she's super chill and she knows when I'm working. I mean, she's already three, so uh, she's kind of used to me working all the time. So. But yeah, I really love her. And That's yeah. Do you have any do you have any personal work you've been doing as well like do you do any sort of art on the side for yourself yeah that's another thing that working from home is great for um, because you're a little more efficient with your time you're not traveling to places and you're not putting like time into commuting anywhere so you have a little bit of extra time when you're at home um so yeah i've been i've been working on some personal stuff that i will release soon <laughs> hopefully uh but I think it's really important to stay active, no matter whether whether or not you have a gig or not. Uh, it's really important to keep working and to keep yourself active at all times and and engaged. So not just doing stuff catered to 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 studios, but also cater it to yourself, so that you're always keeping yourself interested in your work and and creating cool stuff. Um. Also, I'd love to talk about, you know, you're a, a Latina woman working in the industry. Have you faced any challenges around that? Or can you talk about your experience, experiences as a Latina woman in the industry? Sure. Um, uh, I actually, I mean, other than not seeing a lot of women, <laughs> there aren't a lot of women in, in, in the industry overall. I mean, it's growing over time. Um, at Framestore, there were no women in the, in the in the team. Uh, uh, rodeo, there was one or two, uh, myself included. Um, so I guess that's one of the sort of odd things that you have to get used to. Um, it kind of changes the dynamic a little bit because I mean, the social dynamic changes a little bit. I'm not sure how to explain how, but because I'm so used to it, it's already my norm. Um, uh, hopefully that that will change soon. I know uh, by the time I left NBC, there were there were considerably like a lot of of, of women there compared to how when I started. Um, and uh, as a Latino, you know, I I think actually it's beneficial for me, uh, and I'll explain because I I think Latinos overall i have a sense that they're a little more social a little more friendly a little more smiley a little more you know have a little bit of salsa there somehow and um and i think that's kind of lacking in an animator overall or in a vfx artist because you're sitting in your computer all the time um i think it's kind of great to just be a little more friendly and that's really important to just always engage with the people in the office say hello every morning like just like you know, just make make really good friendships because we're gonna be working on cool stuff together for a while. And I think that's one of the, I think I, that kind of stands out from the crowd, I guess, because everybody is so, um, it's more likely for people to be introverted when they're in this field. So I guess that's one of the things that has helped me. I think that's great. You know, you've offered a lot of pieces of advice throughout um, this this interview. Um, is there anything you, that you'd like to leave, uh, especially students or anyone who's looking to uh, gain access into this industry? Any, any other final piece of advice you'd like to offer? Wow, there's a lot of things I'd like to say. <laughs> but um, the most important one for a student who is about to graduate, um, I guess, like, don't get stuck between jobs when you when you're actually in the field so just stay active with your work but also just be true to what you like to do like be true to yourself um like when you when you do personal projects don't just cater them to to specific studios that you where you want to go like be true to yourself and who what you like to do and what because that's that's the only way that you're going to create great stuff you're going to create great because you don't you don't want you don't you don't want to just make stuff for the sake of making stuff. You want to actually make stuff that speaks to people, and and I think that's the best way to do it. I think there's a lot of a lot of great stuff coming from people who work honestly from their heart. I think that's a beautiful sentiment and <laughs> a, a wonderful thing to leave uh, students with. Uh, congratulations <laughs> on all of, all of your success. I'm so thrilled that you've been able to work on such major films and shows. 
Um, and, and we've mentioned so many things that have recently come come out online or on any on very major platforms um, that can be easily accessed right now. So I hope uh, everyone will check them out. I wish you all the best and uh, more success to come. And uh, I want to thank you so much for being here today with us. So great having you, Alejandra. And we'll thank you. See thank you, you for your time. Bye. You too. Bye. Hi, I'd like to welcome Julian DeRoche, a 2016 graduate of SVA's BFA Computer Art, Computer Animation and Visual Effects program. His thesis film, Time Warped, was shown in year one of SVA premieres. Since graduation, Julian has worked as a visual effects digital compositor on several commercials, films, and television shows, including Genius, Elementary, The Good Fight, Five Feet Apart, Fosse Verdon, Motherless Brooklyn, Dickinson, and The Purge pretty amazing. He's got a long list. He's only been out of school a few years. Uh, in 2020 alone, his work can be seen on Little America on Apple TV+, Plus, Timmy Failure on Disney+, Plus, The Plot Against America on HBO, P Valley on Stars, and Spike Lee's The Five Bloods on Netflix. So let's welcome Julian DeRoach. Hey, Julian, how are you? Hi. Uh, thanks, Adam. Like, thank you for having me. Uh, of course. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to be here. So we're thrilled we're thrilled to have you um so let's start out if you can tell everyone a little bit about your experience at sba um you know what it was like going through the bfa computer art program uh yes yeah, so i graduated 2016 may 2016 uh I, so i came in 2012 and i enjoyed my time there i was uh i was in a bfa computer art i started like the first two years you do um, visual effects and animation. And then the next two years you uh, branch off to whatever you want to do. Obviously I went into visual effects and yeah, I thought it was uh, pretty great. And it helped me a ton where to, it helped me a ton and helped me get to where I am now. So, yeah. That's great. And so, as I mentioned, you were a part of year one of SBA premieres. Um, what was that program like for you when we took you out to Los Angeles? Oh, yeah, um, that was like I, I was it was unexpected for me, but uh, that was like a eye opening experience with the industry because I got to talk to like a, a bunch of industry professionals, uh, especially after our like theses were shown in the theater. So, uh, yeah, so I think. Yeah, uh, I think we talked to, um, we visited a couple of different studios like DreamWorks. And uh, I know we got to see Rebecca Sugar who worked on a, a Steven Universe. So that was pretty great, so. Yeah, Re Rebecca Sugar is one of our uh, really significant alumni. She created Steven Universe. and. Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's that's great that you got got to meet her. I'm sure not many people can say that. Um, so you know, beyond your premieres experience, after that, you know, you just graduated, and uh, it looks like your career pretty much took off right after graduation. How did you land your first few jobs? Uh, so after um, after I graduated, I actually landed an internship at Framestore. Uh, so right out of school, I started working and uh, I was there for um, about like two to three months. And then they put me on as freelance for like a couple more months. And then after that, I was just uh, doing freelance after freelance job. And yeah. And then eventually um, where I am today, I'm working a full-time staff job at the Molecules. So that's how I got here. And the Molecule, we have a lot of alumni that work over at the Molecule, uh, someone yes. else who's doing one of our Q&As this week. And it was founded by uh, Luke DiTomaso, who is an alum as well. So that's, yeah. it's really cool that you landed there. And, and clearly they, they do a lot of different projects from film to television to commercials. Mm -hmm. um, you have a reel that I'd like to show. It's, it's really quick and it's a minute long, but it, it gives a good sense of what you've worked on and the kind of work you do. It's really interesting because we were watching it kind of in slow-mo to, to see the, the changes from the initial shot and then once you worked on the shot afterwards. Oh, yeah. And it's such like minutia, um, but 
let's show the reel. And if you want to tell people about it as we're watching, things go by pretty quickly, but mm -hmm. whatever you want to talk about being a digital compositor would be great. Okay. So yeah, this was just like a sequence in Motherless Brooklyn. There was a, like a drive-by sequence where it was a car chase. Uh, this is a couple of shots from Frame Store commercial reel, and this is my thesis. Sorry, it goes by so fast, but uh, these are a couple of commercials. This was a uh, elementary from the Molecule. A couple of um, screen replacements, some Motherless Brooklyn that I worked on last year. Uh, this new show, Little America on Apple, The Purge which I was doing a bunch of photo replacements. We had to do rig removal for the good fight and Fosse Vernon, there was like a bracelet on her hand that would always fall off that I had to put back on. It's really cool. And you, you don't necessarily think that the sort of the director would catch that kind of thing, but it's, it's crazy. And, you know, I'm sure a lot of money is spent putting bracelets and rings on fingers that yeah. were were there one at one point and not there the next. I mean, yeah, it's like all of the like uh, things that you don't notice that we have to like fix. It's like uh, I think we call them like invisible effects. So, like, yeah. So that's well, and usually... and for stuff like that, like in, invisible effects. I mean, who? Who tells you those things? Like, do you get the notes from the from the directors and the assistant directors, or is it stuff that you know you have to watch for? Uh, so we mostly get it from the client side, but like sometimes they wouldn't, they won't like really notice something, and we notice it, and we let them know if uh, this is supposed to be that way, and if it isn't, then we have to go back and fix it. So. And uh, in that reel, I know, I know it was moving so fast, but mm. the dinosaur and like the alien spaceships, that was from your undergraduate thesis project. Yeah. So if you want to talk a little bit about that, because those effects were incredible, uh, especially, you know, for someone coming out of an undergraduate program, um, is right now, you know, it doesn't look like you're creating the big spaceships or anything yet, but is that sort of the end goal for you to, to create those types of visual effects? Uh, yeah, so like that was uh, my personal thesis. So I, I love doing that stuff. Right now, I'm uh, not doing that type of work right now. But eventually, I want to move on to like bigger and bigger stuff and like possibly um, bigger films like the Marvel type stuff. So like Marvel, like a uh, superhero, uh, like sci fi type stuff and work on just like um CG and uh, character integration. So uh, that's eventually the end goal, so. So um, looking at the projects you have worked on, even though there aren't the big special effects blockbusters on the list, I mean, you've worked on some some really terrific films and shows. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Fosse Verdon, you know, is an, uh, is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated series, Motherless Brooklyn, Golden Globe nominee as well. Um, was there any was there any piece that you really enjoyed working on, whether it was because of the piece itself or because of the sequence that you were working on? Yeah, I'd have to say it's definitely Motherless Brooklyn. Uh, the, there's a in the film there's a car chase sequence where it was just um, basically all shot on green screen, and we just had to make it look like it was just shot in like a 1950s Brooklyn. So. Uh, that was pretty fun to do. That took like about like two or three months total. So yeah, that was fun. And how long is that chase sequence? Probably like no longer than two to five minutes. Yeah, it was like two to five minutes. So, <laughs> uh, I, but I loved every minute of it. So that's awesome. And it's yeah. great. It's great that you're working uh, consistently, especially through the pandemic. Um, can you tell us a little bit, since you're still at the Molecule and you're still working, can you talk a little bit about any of the projects you're currently assigned to? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, this is like one that I'm really working on right now, which is uh, Genius uh, Season 3. Um, I think that deals with uh, Aretha Franklin, but 
uh, yeah, that's what I'm working on right now. So. Um, and so, you know, you, you mentioned your setup has like multiple monitors and you don't have to necessarily turn the camera around and show <laughs> us, but, but how, you know, how are you staying motivated? Are you like keeping certain hours for yourself and how are you communicating with your, with your colleagues as well? Uh, yeah. So like, um, uh, I won't lie. It's, uh, harder to stay motivated working from home because you don't have a, um, like your coworkers next to you to like ask questions or just like talk to if um you just wanted to chat a bit. So that's tough, but we still uh, communicate. We still have our hours that we usually do if we were in office. So um, we keep in contact with Slack. So if we have questions or we need to just uh, um, just ask about something, then we use Slack to communicate. So that's, how we've been doing it. Um, just because this is, you know, a topic that is really important to discuss right now, um, I'd love to hear about your experience as a black man in the visual effects industry, uh, whether you faced challenges in the past or um, just, you know, just your whole experience since you've been out of college and working. Mm. Uh, for me, luckily, uh, I haven't really dealt with, like, any negatives as a black man in the visual effects industry, which uh, I don't know about everybody else. I can't speak for everybody, but like for me, I'm lucky that uh, I've had a good experience, especially uh, at the molecule. Like I've, I feel very welcomed and I've had no issues. So, but that's yeah. Good to hear. Um, mm. uh, any, you know, since you're, you've only been out of school about four years now, um, any advice you'd give to students who are coming out of school or to people in general who are looking to get into this industry? Um, suggestions, thoughts? Uh, well, I'd say just um, like if you're uh, at SBA right now, just like listen to what your teachers say because most of them are probably industry professionals. But besides that, just um, try to be proactive and learn on your own because uh, the more you're trying to learn and like uh, on top of what you're learning at school, the better you are, like the better chances you have at getting that job and being better than the, um, like everybody else that's going for that job. So that's what I would say. Thanks. Um, so uh, I don't know, do you have a website or anything where we can keep an eye on your work? I know your IMDB profile is mm -hmm. is pretty up to date, but any other place where we can, is there any place we can check out Time Warped? Is that online anywhere? Uh, yeah, so um, yes, um, if you, uh, you could find me on Vimeo if you type in my name, Julian DeRoach, uh, and that's where you could find my uh, um, thesis, Time Warped, but also my website, uh, julianderoach.com, so. Awesome. Well, we'll put that in the YouTube information below. Um, I want to thank you so much for being here, Julian. Uh, I'm yeah. thrilled that you've been working really consistently on these terrific projects. Um, and I can't wait to see, you know, what comes down the line. And uh, I wish you the best of luck and continued success. So thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me, Adam. It's been a pleasure. Have a good night. Bye. You too. Bye. I'd like to welcome Sarika Prasad, a 2019 graduate of SVA's BFA Computer Art, Computer Animation, and Visual Effects program, whose thesis film, Papito, created with Kenny Rosen, was shown in year four of SVA premieres. Since graduation, Sarika has worked as a lighting and compositing artist for Hornet, and she's now at Nickelodeon, where she's worked on the Nick Jr. shows The Adventures of Paddington, Paw Patrol, and Bubble Guppies. So let's welcome Sarika. Hey, how are you, Sarika? Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Um, so I'd love you to start by telling us a little bit about your experience while at SVA. Uh, well, I, I was pretty blessed to have a good experience. I sort of um, landed uh, in computer art by accident. I meant to apply for design and I thought computer art included digital design. Um, and then they showed the thesis films that accepted students say, and I was like, that's terrifying, but also way cooler. <laughs> so I stuck around and um, it's been 
hard, but uh, really rewarding to learn about this from scratch. That that's so interesting. I mean, was it like almost a mistake on your application, or that was yeah, it was a hundred percent a mistake on my application. I just <laughs> I can't read. <laughs> Uh, well, I mean, your your work, Papito, in uh, which was shown at SVA premieres, it's a collaborate collaborative project with Kenny Rosen. It's a beautiful piece, um, and I know it got a lot of attention. How was your uh, How was your experience at SVA premieres? It was a lot of fun. It was so strange because I didn't think much of my film. I just really fell in love with the process of designing the characters and lighting and. Um, what surprised me the most was just like people kind of felt the love that we put into the film and um, I had all these like industry professionals and alumni that I look up to just coming to me and being like, your film was so great. Um, and yeah, that was like mind blowing. Did, did it lead to any, were there any like jobs or connections that came from that? Because you've been working pretty consistently since graduation. Yeah, the offer for Nick Jr. came in before SVA premieres, but it was really cool um, meeting the LA team that works on the actual shows, whereas uh, Nick, like New York, uh, they work on the promotional stuff. So that was really cool. So, and you're in the New York office for Nick Jr. So is that mainly what you're working on the, the promos for the shows or are you working on the actual shows as well? Uh, we're working on the promos, um, things like those little five second bumpers, which is like, we'll be right back or only on Nick Jr. Um, so they're very small, but there's a lot more fun that we can have with uh, the way we do those. And um, uh, sorry. About how big is the team that works on each of those? Uh, for the Nick Jr. team, I, there's like about 40 of us. Okay. Um, and we're split up into like YouTube and uh, the Noggin, like content for the Noggin app. Um, and then like on air productions too. And and one of your other uh, cohorts is Andy Tai, who's also a part of this video. So you're, you're both working together. Um, so I'd love to, to show a little bit of uh, your work. We have a minute long reel here uh, that we're going to show. And if you just want to talk through your work in general, as we're seeing this, people are going to recognize a lot of the characters and a lot of the shows. Um, and there's even stuff from like Ugly Dolls, which uh, was an, a film from, the, from earlier this year or late last year. Um, that was not Nickelodeon, but again, you, you know, it's a promo, but let's, let's take a look at your reel. So, so here we see Paddington, but tell us yeah. a little bit about what you do. On so these, these I pieces. do like lighting and compositing, which is, I just put the lights in and I make the, uh, output images look pretty and I like put all of that together. Um, and it's really fun to like put characters into real life situations because especially when uh, kids are watching, like I know when I was a kid, I was watching these kinds of things. I'm just like, they're right there. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, this is some of my earlier work uh, from in school. Um, and, and I know that there's a clip from Pepito coming up right there. Yeah, right? it's like one of the opening shots. Um, where the lighting changes a lot. I had a lot of fun with that, uh, creating different settings. And there's that. Yeah, it, it's really, it's really cool work. And in like one of these bumpers that you're like is five or 10 seconds, about how long from start to finish do those pieces take? Uh, it's usually like a week or two, cause there's like a bunch of different versions that we have to make. It's like today at nine, tomorrow at nine, like right now, next things like that. Um, and there's a whole bureaucracy of approval that they need to go through. It's a lot of behind the scenes work. So is there any piece uh, in particular that you've really enjoyed working on so far? Uh, there's a one in my reel called a uh, secret agent Nani. Um, and I, I got to have a lot of fun with the lights, like the lasers just like bouncing off of him and the camera angle was really cool. And it was, it was just, a fun challenge to work on. 
Um, I mentioned it earlier, but I also like compositing the CG characters into live action footage as well. And so that secret agent Nani, that's like a Bubble Guppies character, correct? Yeah, that was for it was a promotional. It was like, yeah, it was a promotional thing for um, that particular episode in the season like each episode had its own uh custom promotional thing and uh that was the one that i worked on got it do you do you actually i mean these are nick jr shows but do you watch them like do you ever do you ever watch the shows i wish but i don't i don't have cable so (laughs) (laughs) they can't even give you like the app for nick jr or noggin or anything like that uh, it's funny. Um, so you mentioned, you know, the office for Nick Jr.'s in Times Square, uh, and you were working there pre-pandemic, but now you've been working from home during the pandemic. Can you talk about that transition and how it's been? Um, yeah, I, the biggest thing about the transition uh, that's impacted me is just like, I miss my coworkers so much. I was so lucky to have a good team and we would get lunch together on Fridays and or every day, but we would eat out on Fridays. And it was so nice just being able to walk over and during downtime and just chat a little bit or ask for help. Um, yeah, that like that's the main thing that I miss. Um, the main thing that I don't miss is the commute. Mm-hmm. I um, do not like Times Square, especially not in the summer, like afternoons as it gets dark and everyone and their mom is flocking. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been down to Times Square since the pandemic at all? Uh, like during the height of it, when nobody was there, my brother and I, we actually took a drive to Manhattan. We like, drove around just to see an abandoned Times Square because that was uh, novel. It's still pretty empty, I have to tell you. Um, so I, it's it's really eerie. It's very weird. Um, but so, you know, since you've been working from home, you know, and we're sort of in your workstation right now, um, which for most people is their entire apartment in Manhattan. Um, but, uh, you know, are you, are you keeping the same hours? Are you able to stay motivated? Are you chatting with coworkers? What's the sort of general day look like for you? Um. Well, right now I'm actually in between projects, so I have a lot of free time on my hand. Um, And I've been doing some personal work, but I do try to keep the same hours. Um, It's very easy to uh, just slip into nocturnal mode. Um, But yeah, like I've just been uh, writing a lot and uh, designing characters for a piece that I'm hopefully going to be collaborating with a friend on. And that's, that's your personal work? Uh, can yeah, you, that's my can personal you, work. If, if you want to, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, it was, um, it's actually inspired by like a poem that my friend sent me. It's like very sad and angsty, um, which is uh, not that I, I'm a sad and angsty person, um, but it's just a nice, change of tone from uh, Nick Jr.'s like a happy go lucky type shows and I would really like to experiment more with like melancholy lighting and darkness and stuff so I'm looking forward to that a lot. Well sad and angsty right now are perfect emotions to be feeling <laughs> during a pandemic so we get we get it but it sounds really interesting and um you know, hopefully you'll you'll keep us abreast of how that project comes along. Um, you know, in going back to like working, you know, working in an office and having, you know, like you said, about you know, forty coworkers, whether at Nick Jr. or elsewhere, I'd love for you to sort of encapsulate your experience being a woman of color in the industry and if there have ever been any issues or challenges around that. Um I don't think I've had any direct challenges, uh, like being a woman. Uh, um, but I did notice, like, out of the entire uh, team, or at least the parts of the teams that I work with, I'm like the only person of like South Asian descent. Uh, at least while I was there, I don't know who's on now. Um, sure. Yeah. 
Um, but it wasn't right, like a thing. I, I just noticed that. Um, but I can definitely say that the culture in the studios that I've worked in, it's definitely male led, like majority male led. And um, yeah, there's there's definitely a bro culture where like they talk about football and then the stock market and stuff like that. <laughs> I'm just like, um, just like, I have to channel my dad sometimes. It's, oh no! Yeah, yeah. But it's it's not. You. It's it's okay. Um, it's definitely getting better, and um, there haven't been, at least for me, haven't been any pressing issues about that that have come up. Yeah, I I mean, do you belong? I know you're not specifically in like you know, like an animator, but do you belong to any sort of affinity groups like women in animation or anything like that? Yeah, I am a part of a uh, women in animation and oh. also um animation uh which is like a space for um the like LGBT animators. So And that was called Panimation? Yeah. Cool. And that's, is it sort of similar to women in animation where they, you know, there's gatherings and there's, you know, events and stuff like that? Yeah, it's just like basically, um, you know, people just trying to lift each other up, look out for each other. That's great. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I haven't heard anyone else discuss it. Um, so, you know, with those groups, you know, being involved with those, um, I'm sure you'd recommend that to other people. Is there any other advice that you'd give to either students who are pursuing this career or people who are, you know, like fresh out of college who are looking to break into this industry? Um, yeah, I would just say, like, put all your love into it. Go hard. Um, I know definitely at school there were people who would bad talk you if you were doing well um and and others notice so like you'll definitely gain some enemies as you gain traction but you know as long as you like love what you're doing uh that'll that'll show through and you'll get recognized for it so yeah pretty much that's great well that Thank you for that. And I'm glad you're you're doing well. And I'm glad that you're that you've been working, even though you're in between projects right now. Um, it's really cool work that you're doing. And I'm, I'm glad to see that you're, you know, excited about that work as well. Um, so, you know, keep us abreast with uh, what you're up to, especially that personal project that you mentioned. Of course. And, <laughs> and uh, it'll be great to see uh, see where you go from here. So thanks so much for being here, Sarika, and be well. All right, thank you. Thank you again for having me. Of course, bye now. I'd like to welcome Andy Tai, a 2018 graduate of SVA's BFA Computer Art, Computer Animation, and Visual Effects program, whose thesis film, A Long Way From Home, made with Eduardo Enriquez, was shown in year three of SVA premieres and went on to win an Independent Shorts Award later that year. Since graduation, Andy has worked as a freelance CG generalist at Ardman Nathan Love, Wyden and Kennedy, and Hornet. And since last year, he's been working at Nickelodeon. I'm excited to hear what he's been working on. So let's welcome Andy. Hey, Andy, how are you? Hello. How are you, <laughs> So <Adam? laughs> uh, I'm glad to hear that, that you've been working and you landed at Nickelodeon. That's pretty awesome. But um, I'd Thank like you. to first start with uh, having you tell us a little bit about your SVA experience as an undergrad. Uh, I think I had a pretty nice experience. Uh, uh, I think freshman year, I didn't have like the classes that I wanted, like the teachers that I wanted because you can't really choose. But I uh, did the best I could in every class and then I think just get the best from every every experience that I can grab on. And overall, it's pretty smooth. And by junior year, I figured out what I want to do, which is uh, lighting. So I just excelled in that uh, specific area. And then, yeah, and then my thesis, a uh, long way from home, uh, is everything that I wanted to make. And then it happened. 
with the help of Eduardo, my partner. So I'm really grateful. <laughs> yeah, I remember. The, I remember that film. It was a it was a cowboy flick, right? Yeah, it's like yeah, a it western, it. and then a samurai. <laughs> Uh, it was great. I was so glad to see it won an award after graduation. Did you just submit it to a festival or how did that uh, come about? I think a uh, computer art program in SBA, they just uh, submitted in, you know, undergrad, they just submitted to a lot of different festivals, like all the work, everyone's thesis, you know, and then see which uh, ones get. And that was the film that we showed at SVA premieres. So, uh, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your experience with premieres when we took you to Hollywood? I, I didn't expect it to be that, what's the word, man? Like, royal? Big. <laughs> I don't know. It's like, yeah. We're, uh, like, everyone's wearing suits and stuff and there's champagne. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, well, a, it's a nice to, experience. We're we have to enhance the networking somehow, you know? I mean, uh, did, did you meet anyone at yeah. you know, networking that was I like, think was did anyone a... sort of, any jobs come out of that for you or? Yeah, I think I, yeah, it did. It did lead to like a few jobs that I had. Uh, someone contacted me because they were able to um, watch my thesis, you know, uh, to like spread the word. That's great. Um, and I've seen, you know, you've worked pretty consistently since graduation, um, freelancing and going mm -hmm. to some different studios, but those are, you know, big studios and other like advertising companies. Can you talk about uh, your career since graduation? Um, so right after I graduated, I was pretty lucky that I got like a consistent booking through different studios. Uh, I was first at Nathan Love and then... No, I was first at Roof, Roof Studio, and I went to Nathan Love, and after that, I went to Hornet, and then to Brand New School. Just, like, I was jumping through all the different studios, because I also wanted to see, like, how each different studio work, and, like, what their style is, so just to, like, get a feel, and then, and then, like, the, the um, down, wait, how do you call that? Uh, downtime? <laughs> downtime came and then there was like no work for me for a month so then i st i started to uh find like my own clients uh which leads to like side projects and then later on uh, i got into nickelodeon i was like permalancing which is like freelance but you're not signed as a you know actual sure. worker but you're there for a long time yeah i, I yeah. was i'm still there uh but i'm going to Nathan again in October. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, can, uh -huh. can you tell us what you worked on while at Nickelodeon? Uh, I don't know if you're allowed to oh, say. Yeah, yeah. yeah, of course. Um, I worked on uh, Blue's Clues. I, I, I was there first for Blue's Clues. Actually, Ryan. Do you guys know Ryan? He's like a little young YouTube star. <laughs> <laughs> and he like, reviewed know, toys. Some of our yeah. viewers, surely. Yeah, yeah some like <laughs> Nickelodeon stuff. Yeah, and I made like a, like a weird door and had like a there's like a bowl that has like weird foam coming out i was simulating yeah but i think they never used it oh wait no they did use it but yeah i can't find it and then <laughs> i worked on i worked on blues clues if you guys know blues clues yeah they turn it it was it was in 2d and then they turn it into 3d so it's mm -hmm. now in cg and then uh paddington as well and like all the kids show it's like uh i'm i'm in Nickelodeon Jr. So Nick Jr. It's like got the, it. Okay. Yeah, the so the Pad the Paddington Television Show, not the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The cool. the Paddington. Tele yeah, it's pretty yeah. like it's it's like the textures and stuff is very nice. Lighting is very nice too. That show, it's a fun it's, fun show to work on. But like that's awesome. Here here in New York, we only do the um you know like the bumpers, um like uh. The beginning and then like the middle you know the end not sure. like on the actual yeah 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 get to like um, make it more beautiful because it's kind of like commercial photo shows if you know why yeah. yeah 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 so um we actually have some photos and video of some stuff that you've worked on and i know that you, you know you mentioned to me um before this that some of this stuff are either personal projects or were like freelance projects for yeah. other clients. So if you want to tell yeah. us a little bit about that, we'll, we'll look at the, um, 
at the photos first and then show some video. Uh -huh. We're gonna throw those up. So, so this is yeah. my personal personal work. Uh, uh, like after graduation, whenever I have free time, I would try to like think of uh, ideas. And this one is just uh, flowers put on like a electrocution chair. I don't know. There's like some metaphor, you know, like we're killing plants or something. And I try to like <laughs> light it very nice. Yeah, it's just for fun, but um, yeah. <laughs> That's that's it, cool. I mean, it's yeah. it's cool. It's cool work. Do like you ever? Light, you know. Yeah, I mean, uh, we can go to the next photo. Um, do you ever? I mean, these are really beautiful images. Do you ever like print them and and sell them, or they're really just for you? Oh man, I mean, if someone wants to buy them, sure. But I don't think anyone <laughs> would want to buy them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, this one is yeah. I, I just had this image in my brain. Oh yeah, yeah this one. Um, it's a uh, wait. What's that? What's that genre of art? The Dali. Like Dali, yeah. yeah. Like um, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm blanking yeah. on that, but I know what you're talking about. Man, yeah. It was uh, start with a S? No, P. Surrealism. Yeah. No S. Surrealism. Surrealism. Yeah. Surreal, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's surrealism. Yeah, I just thought of it. In, just try to make it make some sort of CG surrealism. And then the, la yeah. the last photo that we got. Go. Yeah. This is like another study in lighting. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of uh, based on a song uh, by a Cantonese band called Beyond. And I try to imagine like what they're album cover might be for that song you know and this is what i came up with the the, the song title means uh, cold rain night yeah <laughs> in english it's very cool i mean you, i think you underestimate yeah. i think people would buy it would buy your work um if you you know if you printed these they're yeah. really great i think so um or you could Thank sell you. them this this is their album cover let's show some of the videos that you've created we're gonna skip to that okay. and it's they're, they're more like, you know, movement videos and you can tell us a little bit about those. Mm -hmm. So these are all like um, side projects, what I call them. It's like I have my studio, like, so like 10 to 7 is like studio work. And then after 7, I might pick up some other projects, you know. Um, and those previously were like for ASAP Rocky for his... Uh, merchandising advertisement on Instagram, like That's scanning awesome. stuff and then putting it together. Yeah. And we have one more thing Basically. where it sort of it sort of demonstrates your work more specifically. So we're gonna we're gonna throw that up, and it shows what you do as as a lighting artist in in CG. So it's basically a breakdown. If you kind of want to tell us, we're gonna play it through and it shows the lighting that you've added yeah. to it. But if you want to talk about how you created this. So I made this uh, during the pandemic in Bangkok because I was stuck there for five months. <laughs> and uh, then it was like right at the beginning, it was like during January, like New York was still fine. And I made this because like China was like, you know, so it's like a, you know, like a fun work relating to the event. And then so what we uh, what I would normally do is get like these models and with all the textures and then I would add lights in it. So yeah, this is just a sky dome, which is like a flat lighting, you know. And then here we starts to add more light. And then the next one is some volumetric to give it more depth, you know, and like more interest. And the last step is to composite it to like add in fire the effects and you know some lens distortion or something yeah make it more beautiful this is what i do <laughs> that's great no it's very cool um cool. so yeah. you know you you showed us a bit of your personal work a bit of your freelance work and we heard about your the mm -hmm. other work that you've done Have, has there been any like piece that you've worked on whether it be you know a freelance job or something else that you really enjoyed working on so so far yeah, there there have been 
like a side project that I really loved, but I can't show it because it's like a pitch for a feature film and it's still going on. So I could, yeah. But like everything went smoothly and then the director is nice, <laughs> you know, and yeah. I think, I think when you have good clients, those are the best work, you know? Yeah, good client have, is ha important. <laughs> have you worked on any films so far or would this be your first? Like like feature film? I mean, yeah. no, no, that that was just a pitch. Yeah, I haven't worked okay. on feature films because uh, in New York, there's not much feature film production in in CG. We mostly do like commercial and stuff. Yeah, sure. So if I want to do feature, I'll have to like go to Montreal or like LA and stuff. Got it. But you yeah. know that be that being said, everyone's working remotely now, and you just mentioned you were yeah, stuck true, in stuck in Bangkok for five months, but you were still yeah. working. So. Can you tell us a little bit about mm -hmm. how you've been working during the pandemic and were you wor were you working when you were out in Bangkok, even though you were stuck there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah so like, because I had um, side projects from before, the pandemic happened when I was trapped at Bangkok because because of time difference, I can't work with st uh, studios here in New York. So I had to still pay rent in New York. So I had to like rely on my side projects. And it's great that I have my side projects, or else I'll be broke. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so but like, how did you still give me like? Uh huh. Oh how yeah. How did you stay, stay motivated? motivated? Yeah. Yeah. Oh how, man! If you have to pay rent, you gotta you know pay rent, man. You gotta <laughs> stay, yeah. So like, and I was lucky enough that I made the connection before that they still have like jobs again for me. Yeah. So I was able to still work while in Bangkok, yeah. Um, so, I, you know, this is something I've, I've asked several people in your industry, but I'd be interested to hear your take. You know, mm -hmm. as, a, as a person of color, have you experienced any issues in your industry or has it generally been okay for you thus far? I think, I think it's okay for me. Yeah, I think not, there, there's not much like discrimination yeah, I haven't felt anything crazy. I think in almost every industry, well, I don't know, just in my industry personally, I feel that um, it's all about like who you are, like how nice you are. And uh, if you have the skills and the talent and the motivation to do what you want and the work ethic, you know, yeah. You need to like, just, just don't be an asshole. That's good advice man it's very good advice and that's <laughs> actually that actually leads to my last question which you know I was going, I, I, it's great no I, any piece of advice for either students uh -huh. or people who are looking to get involved in this field i think that's a great piece of advice but if uh -huh. you want to expand on it and offer anything else any words of wisdom i think i think in the cg industry um a big like a very big factor is how nice you are like how, how people look at you because it's a, it's a pretty small industry and we know everyone. So word spreads pretty fast if, you know, you're not nice or being, you know. So um, to people who want to come into the CG, um, dude, there's so many tutorials online. You can start there. You can come to SVA. It's a great school. It got me where I wanted, like everything I wanted to learn, I got it from SVA. So I'm happy with it. Um, you can, you know, there's like a lot of ways to uh, enter my industry. And for the students, uh, I'd say like figure out what you want to do in CG and focus on it. If you want to be a generalist, just learn everything you can while you're in school because that's the best time to, you know, to learn. Yeah. Now I don't have that's much time to learn. I have to learn while I'm working. <laughs> yeah. I think that's great advice. Um, before we go, can we see your see your workspace? And, oh, yeah. uh, and if you if you have any office mates, whether they be roommates or pets or otherwise, this is Momoko. Momoko <laughs> sleeping on the <laughs> job. <laughs> this is Shiba Inu. <laughs> yeah, and this is this is like my setup for my workspace. It's just like my laptop and another screen and. Wacom tablet, you know, it's nothing fancy. I need to upgrade my 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 stuff, man. Oh, well, that's to cool. And I'm do, like, yeah. I'm glad. I'm glad you've been working really consistently. 
Um, and uh, and I'm glad you're doing okay. I'm glad you got back from Bangkok uh, after being stuck. Thank for you, so thank long. you. Yes, and it's uh, a crazy uh, trip, man. It was like yeah. 48 hours. <laughs> so, uh, so how long was your trip supposed to be, and and how long did it become? Oh, it was supposed to be 48 hours. It was 48 hours. <laughs> and five months yeah. later, <laughs> you're back. <laughs> yeah, five well, months later. Well, I'm glad you're safe oh, and sound. Oh, oh, wait, wait, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it was supposed to be just like two months and then became like five months. Okay. Well, uh, like I said, I'm, gl I'm glad you're safe and sound. I'm glad you're working. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. Keep us up to date what you've been working on and, uh, and hopefully we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Adam, for having me. <laughs> yeah. Hi, I'd like to welcome Kristen Scarborough, a 2017 graduate of SBA's BFA Computer Art, Computer Animation, and Visual Effects program. His film Playground Warfare was shown in the second year of SBA premieres. Since graduation, Kristen has worked on several major films and television shows as an animator and layout artist, including Genlock, Ruby, and Doolittle. Most recently, he worked on Disney's The Call of the Wild and Artemis Fowl, both of which premiered earlier this year, and Jungle Cruise, which is slated for release in 2021. So let's welcome Kristen. Hey, Kristen, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. Thanks so much for being here. Um, so I'd love to start first with your SBA experience, if you could talk a little bit about that, and then... Uh, at the end, after graduation, we took you to LA to be a part of the SBA Premieres program. So I'd love to hear a little bit about your experience with that as well. Well, I started SBA in 2013, and it was quite an experience for me. Being in New York, that was like uh, one of the hub, a uh, major hub around the film industry. And uh, a lot of commercial houses were in the area too. So. I did notice that a lot of my teachers were actually working nearby, like working on films or television shows or commercials. So that made me feel like I was really in the heart of the industry, right where I was in New York. So yeah, that was a good experience for me. Um, yeah. And then, uh, like I said, you know, we showed your, your thesis film, Playground Warfare, in the second uh, iteration of SBA premieres. So you got to go to Los Angeles with some other recent alumni. Can you talk about that experience uh, and, and if it helped propel your, your career? Yeah, so my film was chosen to be part of uh, the second SBA premieres in LA. And um, yeah, that was a fun experience for me. That was my first time in LA seeing where a lot of these movies are made in Hollywood. Um, I got to go on a few field trips to different studios and I got to talk to different alumni from SVA. And it was in talking to one of these alumni that I decided I wanted to be a previs and layout artist because before then I wanted to do, wanted to do animation. But after talking to this alumni, he made me realize that hmm, previs and layout sounds a little bit more up my alley. So it was after that I switched to previous and layout. I applied to a few studios and then I got accepted to my first major job, my first major film job. That's great to hear. Um, so just for the non animators who are watching this, can you describe what uh, previs and layout involves? Previs is short for pre visualization, and that is the planning out of shots before they are filmed or animated in a 3D space on the computer. And, and layout goes along with that as well? Yes, they're used interchangeably a lot. So you'll have to ask the studio that you're working at what word they're using. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, so you've worked, speaking of studios, you've worked at several major visual effects studios, including the third floor and, uh, and MPC. Can you sort of give us a sense of how your career has progressed since graduation was were you going from studio to studio were you working freelance on different films and television shows well yeah so my first major job was in la at the third floor and i worked on a few films there and then after that i got hired for a job in in texas at rooster teeth animation and so my first job i was working on live action films my second job, I was working on animations. And then my third job, which was MPC in Montreal, 
I went back to live action. And then my fourth job, which is right now here in Toronto, I am working on animations again. So I, I do have a preference for animation, but I can do either or, you know, I like them both. Well, and I think we actually have uh, your reel. Um, it's mostly a animation, but, uh, and it, it shows a little bit of your thesis work. So uh, we're gonna show your reel and I'd love for you to tell the audience uh, what they're seeing um, as, as we watch it. Um, so we're gonna bring that up and go ahead, take it away. Okay. Oh, so this is a scene I worked on at Rooster Teeth. The show is called Gen Lock. I was the one who planned out the shots in this scene. I was given some storyboards and was told to block it out in 3D. So that's exactly what I did. The camera placements and uh, where the characters got uh, where they run to, all of that was planned out by me. And you said that this show is on uh, available on roosterteeth.com, that it's a web series. Yes. And this is the first shot I worked on in my thesis film. This is just some class work I did. This is a weight exercise, just to show how heavy the car is. I also worked on this scene at Rooster Teeth. This scene took several weeks to make. Um, originally, it was supposed to be uh, several shots, but the director decided that he wanted it to be like one long continuous scene. So it was up to me to do that. Oh, I worked on this shot as part of Anim Squad. It's an online school. And I worked on this after graduating. I wanted an extra dialogue piece to put in my reel. This is another shot from my thesis film, one of my favorites to work on. This is another class assignment. And this is a personal project that I worked on during college. It's kind of crazy. I mean, the personal project looks insanely professional. Um, I know that we've graduated several, you know, top visual effects people from your program, and it's it's great to hear uh, how your how your career has progressed so far. Is there any favorite project that you've worked on, whether it be a particular film or or show or even a particular scene that you've worked on? Any any favorites amongst your your list so far? Well, my two favorite projects would be Genlock, which um, you saw a lot of that in my reel, and the one that I'm working on right now, which I am looking forward to seeing, but I really can't say much about it. it should premiere um, next year on Netflix, so look out for that. It's called, I can tell you what it's called, it's called. What, why don't we not tell I'm not, people, I'm not people what it's called? What it's called but when, when it comes out, I'll make an announcement. That, that's awesome. And, um, you know, I, I noticed we discussed that you do some personal work on the side. I mean, we saw some of that in your reel, but you also said you're, you're creating on the side um, and posting some stuff to Instagram right now. Can you talk about that work a little bit? Yeah, recently I got into a VJing. That's um, the visuals that you see in the background at like a, like a rave, or a nightclub. So I decided, yeah, I want to try doing that. So I've been making um, these little uh, motion graphics loops. It looks like really neon techno-y kind of effects. So that's something I've been doing on the side recently. I just have a few stuff on Instagram, but I plan to be posting more. Awesome. We'll put your Instagram link in the YouTube information below. So definitely check that out. How'd you get into it? Was it just a personal inclination to just start trying those things? Or did someone tell you, hey, I got this rave going on. Can you create this for me? Well, while I was in Montreal, I started going to a lot of raves. Uh, my friend invited me to a lot of raves and she wants to be a DJ. I'm like, okay, cool. That's good for you. And then it was in November, I went to a rave and I saw, I was really intrigued of the visuals that I was looking at. You know, everybody else is listening to the music. I'm watching the visuals. So I'm like, you know what? I want to do something like that. So that's actually what got me into making um, VJ loops. 
That's awesome. And so you mentioned you're in Toronto now and you're working on a particular project that'll be on Netflix. Are you with working within uh, a studio right now or are you freelancing? I'm working, well, I'm working for the studio. I'm not currently in it because of the pandemic. But, <laughs> but yes, I am working for a studio here in Toronto. So let's let's talk about how you're working during the pandemic. Um, I know, you know, we're actually in your studio right now, so you can't actually show it. Um, but you have all the equipment there, which is which is great, and it's terrific that you're working during the pandemic. How do you how do you stay motivated right now? Are you on a set schedule, and how are you communicating with your colleagues? Well, I mean, it's not that hard to stay motivated once you like what you're working on. So. I like what I'm working on, so it's not it's not a problem for me. But um, to stay connected with my colleagues, we use uh, Microsoft Teams, and every Friday we have a big group chat to talk about anything that's not related to work or coronavirus. So we just talk about any anything that comes to mind. And actually, next Sunday we have a beach party planned, so I uh, definitely going to that. That's awesome that you can stay in touch with everyone, and you're probably you're probably safer there in, in Canada than we are here. But um, but I'm glad to hear that you're you're working during the pandemic. Um, you know, with with this studio and with other studios you've been working at, I'm sure the audience would be interested to know your experience as a black man working in this industry. I don't know if you faced any challenges with that, but if you could talk about your experience, uh, I'm sure that would be of interest to people. Well, I have heard of other people experiencing um, obstacles um, being a person of color, but for me, I have not personally experienced any challenges. That's good to hear. Um, since, you know, with working from home, even though, like you said, you're working with a studio but are not in the studio right now, do you see um, this being a change that could potentially happen going forward where people are working from all around the world and not necessarily in the studio? Or do you think once this all gets better that we'll, we'll be going back into those studios? Well, that's actually something that we talked about at work because since, we've, um, since we started doing remote work, we have not missed any deadlines. Like we've been on track. So we're wondering hmm, if we're all still on track and working from home, what's the point of going back to the studio? I mean, maybe some people might go back. I don't know, maybe like supervisors or the people who have to be around each other. But me personally, like my schedule has not really changed at all. But I guess that would be different for people with, our, you know, children to look after who are and a dog in the house and that kind of stuff. But for me, I'm fine. Sure, that's great. Um... You know, I'd love to hear any advice now that you've been out of school for a few years and you've had you've been really successful thus far consistently working, which is, is so great to, to see. Um, do you have any advice for students or other people who are looking to get involved in this field or pursuing this line of work? Um, and especially in light of the pandemic, um, I'm wondering, are there more jobs in animation right now? I've heard some rumor of that. Um, I, hopefully there, there's an abundance of projects since it's more difficult to, to film for live action, but any advice that you could offer would be terrific. Well, my advice for others would be not, do not be afraid to apply anywhere, like absolutely anywhere in the world. When I first started, I was only applying to play other places in New York. Then I expanded to other places in the US. And then after my second job, I applied to anywhere in the world. That's how I ended up in Canada. I have a friend who actually uh, worked in Bangkok for a while. He just applied to everywhere. So that's my advice. Just apply anywhere and just know that you're not, you don't have to stay where you're working forever. You, know, you can have a job in a different country, stay there for a few months and then, and then leave if you're just starting out. And I, I, I've heard, you know, there are several visual effects studios in Canada, both in Toronto and Vancouver. Um, so it's, you know, it's great to see that that you're willing to go to some far flung places, even though Toronto is not necessarily that far. But um, uh, any, you know, I, I think that that advice is outstanding and we're really thrilled um, that you're 
working consistently. And when you can let us know what the Netflix show you're working on is, please put that on your Instagram so people will, uh, will know about it. But I wanna thank you so much, Kristen, and I wish you the best of luck and continued success. So thanks again, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing more of your work soon. Bye now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. I'd like to welcome Elena Briantes, a 2016 graduate of SVA's BFA Computer Art, Computer Animation, and Visual Effects program, whose thesis film, Awesome Adventure, created with Yana Pan, was shown in year one of SVA premieres. Since graduation, Elena has worked for the visual effects studio Frame Store, where she served as a compositor on many commercials, including those from Microsoft, Nespresso, and Toyota, as well as on TV shows and films, including most recently, I Know This Much Is True on HBO. So I'm very pleased to welcome Elena. Hey, Elena, how are you? Hey, Adam, how's it going? Hello, uh, fellow SBA people. And, and the general public, ever, anyone and everyone who wants to watch are here, but, um, but special shout out to the SVA people watching. <laughs> um, thank you for being here. And speaking of SVA, uh, I'd first love for you to tell us a little bit about your SVA experience as an undergrad. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, everyone, I, I think everyone has their own unique experience with art school. And I always say that's because you get what you put in. You know what I mean? Um, and I realized that pretty early on. And uh, what was unique to SVA to me was how close to opportunities you were constantly with your professors being either full-time professionals, you know, coming straight out of work to teach a class or um, being close to equipment in, in BFA CAD or even um, the field department where you can rent um, the top equipment, readily, readily accessible, um, you always get you know, the newest programs and everything like that. So you really had to uh, play all your cards to um, be as efficient and really make the most of, of what is a really well-equipped school. Um, and everyone is, is also having the same idea and the same path. So you're, you're with people who are just as motivated as you to learn and use everything that's given to you. And so you were a participant in year one of SBA premieres and you got to go to Hollywood uh, with us. Uh, how was that experience for you? That was really cool. Um, I didn't think that that would be an opportunity ever. And like you said, it was year one. So it was the uh, first time, I guess, um, hearing of, of, of SBA wanting to send people out to LA specifically like I'm, I'm an East Coast girl, I've been on the East Coast my whole life. Not to say that I've never been to the West Coast, but getting the opportunity to see the industry on the West Coast was like, ah, here's, you know, quite literally the other side of the country <laughs> in how <laughs> things, are, things are going there. Everyone's getting Ubers, there's cars, uh, there's no subways. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. Um, everyone kind of having the, the glitter in their eyes. We got to tour Titmouse, I think. Uh, Titmouse, super awesome animation studio. Um, you know, it, they've been on my radar for a while, so it was really neat to get to go in and to meet those people. Um, and yeah, I think it was a really great opportunity. And so you actually walked into SVA premieres already having an internship, and I'm pretty certain that propelled uh, you into your career, which has been uh, pretty prolific over the past four years. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, it Prolific in the sense that, you know, I, I've been with Framestore in New York for four years now. So it's a, been a very steady um, career, just kind of building up, building relationships with my coworkers and, and with Framestore. Um, they took me in as an intern pretty early on before graduation. I accepted the offer and been there ever since. Uh, it's It's been, and I'm still there to this day, uh, working from home with Framestore. And even as I grow in my career at Framestore, Framestore as a studio is also evolving. Um, it was, it used to be a film uh, studio before I came in, and then they dropped film, started to be advertising exclusively, and now we have picked up, you know, immersive VR stuff. Um, we picked up episodics, so we're also doing TV as we speak. So as the studio grows, I am also growing with what the studio learns. So that's been really interesting. 
That's great. You actually uh, sent us the reel from Framestore and quite a few SVA alumni work at Framestore. So I'm sure that even though this isn't specifically your work that we're going to show, it, some of it includes your work and I'm sure some of it was touched by other SVA alumni. So we're going to show that and we'll... Yeah, so I unfortunately have not <laughs> made or updated my reel in a few years, but um, Framestore has a much more professional and way more thorough advertising reel. Um, and it should be noted that this is across all of their studios. So London, LA, uh, New York, Chicago, Montreal, uh, the works. Um, so you see a lot of, we do a lot of like really photo reel animals. Um, and you know, our range of, of work is pretty phenomenal. Uh, there's the gecko. We all know that little guy. Um, but yeah, I, uh, speaking of the gecko, I would say he's probably one of my more, uh, uh, one of the projects I've kind of grown up with. Like, I, you know, it's common as a comp intern on Framestore or just, you know, other interns and juniors at Framestore. You slowly work your way up and eventually you get introduced to the gecko, uh, the Geico gecko. And getting to work on him is almost like a rite of passage and, and eventually moving on to lead gecko commercials. Um, which then opens up leading other projects, which is really fun. Um, but yeah. Is, is there one project that you've worked on while at Framestore that you sort of loved working on beyond all others? Um, one recent one that we actually did while working from home was the Geico Rocket League spot. Uh, it's kind of funny. Uh, Rocket League is a video game um, by Psyonix and I actually got the commercial while I was on Twitch watching some streams and it was quite funny. Um, mm. But it was a lot of fun. It was fully 3D, which I, I enjoy working on as a compositor personally. Uh, so it was really cool. So that one I'm quite happy with. This is a Destiny 2 trailer, which is pretty neat. It was between LA and New York. That was a cool project. Can you tell us a little bit about what a compositor does specifically? Yeah, so a compositor um, new compositor specifically will take, it's like After Effects with nodes and on absolute steroids. Um, the amount of detail that you can go into in Nuke is painful and terrifying, but it gives you so much control over an image. Um, compositing is the definition of, you know, taking two images and making a new image out of it. Um, so, you know, all day we're, we're adjusting pixels, we're keying green screens and putting in um, new backgrounds, set extensions. Um, it's mainly uh, 2D work. There will be occasionally you know, 3D work if, if the effect is either more complicated, enhancing something within live action or just creating a new um, environment entirely. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it really is just a world of possibility um, as a compositor. So it's a little, you know, <laughs> Yeah. yeah. How, how did you choose that track and how did you choose to get involved in visual effects? Like, was that, was that a choice when you went into SVA or was it something you were working on in high school? Um, no. Well, yes and no. I didn't intentionally go to computer art with the intention of becoming a compositor. It was more of a fell into my lap kind of situation. Um, I, I actually came into computer art, you know, having a love for video games and, and, CGI and things like that and just the fascination with visual effects in general um, and thinking about it now there were uh, years of high school or middle school where I might have been um, on on websites like DeviantArt or Tumblr just you know making making cool images in Photoshop or um, just fan art things like that and, and I didn't realize that all those little instincts I was building using Photoshop in high school or middle school it was like wow I'm still having those same instincts today in my professional career. And it's like, oh, that's pretty neat. That's neat to think about. It was always there, you know? And you mentioned this when you were talking about the Geico commercial that you did that from home. Can you tell us a little bit about working from home during the pandemic? Are, are we in your workstation right now? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So to preface, uh, I play a lot of video games, hence like the huge headset and the, you know, <laughs> decent microphone with like I a, thought you were a, a mobile microphone. I wasn't sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's on one or the other, but um, I play a lot of video games. So that involves like talking with a lot of my friends over programs like Discord. Um, so I have a lot of monitors. Uh, if you can take a crack at how many I have currently, not counting the TV. 
four. How many do you think? Ooh, yeah, I actually have four monitors. Oh, okay. Right now. So I, I yeah. could tell it was more than the normal two or three. So yeah. Yeah. Um, one of them's from work, granted, but um, when you say, oh, why do you need three monitors? The answer is, well, of course I need them. What wouldn't I use them for? Um, but yeah, so working from home has been interesting. It was definitely something to grow into. Um, all of us from Bristol, New York, were all fully remote. Some people, granted, now that, you know, things are a little bit better, some people can go in and out of the office um, to capacity, um, to a certain capacity, rather. But it, it's been uh, a growing pain that everyone was learning because, you know, we, uh, no one had predicted needing to work from home at the drop of a hat, you know. So things like internet, equipment, um, just having a new sort of pipeline where, or not necessarily pipeline, but new habits. Um, being more communicative was super important. Having more precise uh, notes when you're leaving comments on work that you finished for your supervisor's review, because you can't just go to your desk anymore and be like, oh, by the way, uh, I, I changed this, this, and this. Like, you have to write sure. that in and be sure that you're uh, making things as easy as possible for someone else to pick up. Um, because we're, you know, in our homes all the time. Um, and it's quite funny, like, I have my fourth monitor from work on a bookcase that just happens to be next to my desk. So <laughs> it's clear that our New York apartments were not built to <laughs> handle uh, an extended battle station. <laughs> yeah. Um, how do you, do you feel like it's relatively easy to stay motivated? Are you, are you doing any sort of personal work when you have downtime? Um, product, productivity has always been an interesting interesting uh topic or not topic but um interesting thing to navigate in working from home and i think a lot of that is kind of compounded by how much easier it is for us to stay online all the time and on social media especially i recently heard a term that i think very accurately describes it um, known as doom scrolling where you oh, are yeah. scrolling through twitter and instagram like you just need, like, as humans, we're like fidgety creatures. We can't sit still for very long. So we are scrolling through Twitter and, and seeing all this news that is like not something you want to wake up to on a Monday. And it can, it hurts. It hurts to see people out there suffering and sorry to get a little serious for a moment, but you know, I recently, I want to be open about this for anyone who thinks that, you know, they shouldn't or, or feel like they can't, but it's okay to look for help at a time like this, especially, or even in normal circumstances, if you feel like your brain or your mental health is debilitating and you think no one around you can help you, well, hopefully someone can, um, it's okay to look for help and look for a therapist, especially if it affects your daily life, um, like it was affecting, you know, just Motivation, as you said, to work, to, to get, getting out of bed is hard now. Mm -hmm. It's really hard and that's okay. Um, and, you know, I was able to find a therapist um, with some diligent Google searching, uh, always do your research, but you know, it's okay. But it, it's, it's okay to talk about it. And I want people to be like, you know, more accepting of, of mental health problems and if you're not productive because, you know, you're doom scrolling and life sucks, you know, it, that's okay. We're here. You're not alone. I think it's a great point that you make. Um, you know, I think a lot of us, especially those who might not be working or even those who were at the beginning of the pandemic or even still, it's, it is very difficult. So, you know, you mentioned that you do have personal work that you don't necessarily show, but has that helped you get through this time, creating on creating your own work on the side? Yes, absolutely. Um, as as someone who's who is prone to just making something, um, you know, whether it's food or or just a simple drawing, um, something that has been keeping me social and keeping me in touch with um, my friends and people I love has been uh, Dungeons and Dragons. And if anyone asks me about Dungeons and Dragons, it's, it's really hard to get me to just stop talking. Like I'm, you see me on the video, I'm literally drinking out of a tankard right now. <laughs> but 
but um, Dungeons and Dragons changed my life. TLDR. Um, and it gives me a lot of opportunity to create, like draw characters or, or draw even like little fantasy maps and things like that. There's a never ending um, source of inspiration that has really been so much fun to continue and has been really great for my own mental health. Um, and you know, it's just fun. Rolling That's dice great. is fun. Yeah. Has that been something you've been into for a long time or did you discover it pretty recently? Um, I discovered it probably at the beginning of like 2018, 2019, maybe. Okay. Um, but it, it's just something that you can do anywhere. You can do it out in the woods. You can do it with pen and paper. You can do it online. Um, yeah, it's just been, it's such an accessible uh, game and it has such a large community that it's, it's hard to, to uh, miss out, I guess. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, you know, as part of the, the doom scrolling, some of the issues of the day revolve around working in the industry and, you know, issues that both women and people of color face working in, in the Hollywood industry, whether it's in film, animation, or like you, in visual effects. Can, being both a woman and a person of color, can you speak to any challenges you faced or has your experience been relatively good thus far? I will say um, everyone's experience is individual, but that also doesn't mean you shouldn't believe them. Um, and, and my personal experience, um, not like, uh, uh, this goes beyond frame store. Um, it's, I would say, and I'm, I'm a pretty uh, self-preserving person. Um, so naturally, like, I say it's okay to protect yourself in situations. If you don't think that you can handle, or not handle, but if you don't think that you would be safe putting yourself out there, like it's okay to protect yourself from, um, you know, uh, people who might be abusive or, or might take advantage of you or um, just undercut you. Like it's okay to say no to things like that. Um, it's okay to say, you know, that's not for me. And it, you, you, it's up to you to surround yourself with people that you trust and, and uh, people who will uplift you and listen to your voice. Um, there, there have been several instances where, you know, I, I might get invited out to drinks or, or peer pressure to like, you know, follow this idea or that idea or, or hang out with these people. And, you know, it, I don't trust them sometimes or, or that, you know, situation. So I didn't feel bad saying, you know, no, I'm not putting myself in that situation. I'm protecting myself because there, you know, things can get ugly. So it's, um, how, do, how do I end this thought? It's, it's not the end of the world if you, if you say no to opportunities where you think you're undercutting yourself to put yourself, you know, in what you might think be a better, be a better position, but might hurt in the end. You know? No, I think it's a it's a great point that you make. Um, you know, and you've already given a lot of good advice thus far. Um, is there anything else that you'd want to say to students? You know, especially right now, um, if if you're not already aware, SVA is going virtual this fall. Um, as students who are entering SVA as freshmen, or as students who are you know about to exit as seniors who are looking to get involved in this field, do you have any other advice that you wanna, you wanna posit? Yeah, um, one thing that has always been consistent, not only with art school or at work, but with, you know, outside and personal relationships and things like that, you should always be someone, you should never think that you're the smartest person in the room. I think, you know, even if, even if you're, you're you know, if, if you got 40 years on your belt, and it's just you and an intern in a room. You're still not the smartest person in the room. You know, that intern can can teach you something. Well, maybe uh, it would be cool if they could. Um, but you know, you, you don't want to assume that. And and that goes along the lines of ego or or just being able to help people. Like if um, a freshman raises their hand in class um, or comes to you. Like I've had situations in in SBA where 
it's a super collaborative environment. Anyone can pop into different labs and, and ask, hey, what's up? Um, you know, I'll be a senior in the senior labs and someone like a, a junior or sophomore might come in and be like, hey, Elena, I have a new question. Can you come show me that thing? And I'll be like, yeah, sure. That sounds awesome. I'd be happy to help you because it's your, if you are willing to help someone, you're only putting in um, better energy and, and better quality of work, better people into the industry. You know, you're paying it forward and you're only improving the community by doing that. That's great. I mean, you've offered a bundle of sage advice and wisdom. I think it's it's so cool. And the work the work that you're doing is really interesting. We've seen uh, quite a few of your colleagues who've graduated in your year and in the subsequent years following that. Um, and as someone who's not a visual effects uh, artist, it's it's so neat to see. And uh, it's funny because we, we don't know all the work, people who aren't visual effects don't know all the work that goes into it, but we see it all across our daily life, whether it be in commercials like that you work on or in films and television. Um, so it's, it's very cool to talk to people in the industry and I appreciate your insight and I'm thrilled that you've been working consistently since graduation. Um, and I want to thank you for being here with us. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Adam. I know we touched on, um, you know, some things that, that will get people thinking, um, but I hope everyone is staying safe and, and you guys as well are staying safe and healthy. And I hope uh, SBA has a super successful, um, you know, issues barred, uh, successful virtual fall semester. Well, we hope so too. Thank you very much. And we hope to hear from you soon. Yeah, thank you guys. Thanks so much for watching. We hope you enjoyed this Q&A and hope you'll check out our other after school special videos on the School of Visual Arts' YouTube channel. Thank you for your interest in and support of SVA and its alumni and for your support of the arts in general. Stay safe, stay healthy, and be well.